This is a six-minute film about the origin of eukaryotes. Modern theories have it that eukaryotes arose from a symbiosis of two cells, an archaeal host here in red and a bacterial symbiont here in blue. According to one theory, the hydrogen hypothesis, the physiological basis for their symbiotic association was a principle called anaerobic syntrophy. The symbiont could respire oxygen, but under anaerobic conditions, it produced hydrogen gas from fermentations. This made it indispensable for the host, which was a hydrogen-dependent archaeon, a methanogen, that strictly required hydrogen gas as a source of energy and electrons. What we just saw was the start of the symbiosis. It was important, but let's back up and look again, because something else important is going on. Note the vesicles being secreted by the endosymbiont and the host. These are outer membrane vesicles, membrane-bounded compartments that prokaryotes secrete into the environment. They play a role in the interactions of modern microbes with their surroundings. They will also play an important role in this theory as drivers for the origin of bacterial lipids in eukaryotes and the origin of the eukaryotic endomembrane system. The tight physiological association between the two cells leads to a situation where one cell resides within the other. The symbiont still generates hydrogen to fuel the host, but two transformations set in. First, outer membrane vesicles deposit bacterial lipids into the host's plasma membrane, initiating the transition to bacterial lipids in eukaryotes. Second, additional chimerism sets in. If the occasional symbiont lyses, then its entire genome can recombine with that of the host. The endosymbiont can divide. This gene transfer from the endosymbiont transforms the host into a genetic chimera an archaeal genetic apparatus expressing bacterial genes. This establishes many bacterial-type biochemical pathways in the cytosol, and the host becomes a heterotroph with mitochondrial energy metabolism built in from the beginning. Gene transfers from the symbiont bring along genetic hitchhikers, introns, shown here in yellow. Bacteria contain genetic elements called group 2 introns. These can remove themselves from the mRNA by encoding a maturase. They are self-splicing. They can also multiply and spread, with the ability to insert themselves into many different sites in the genome. But during eukaryote origin, these group 2 introns underwent a fateful transition. They fragmented into smaller introns and splicing machines called the spliceosome, shown here in green. The transition to spliceosomes had a huge consequence. They are slow, slower than the ribosome. These spliceosomal introns interfere with translation at all genes where they are present, if they are active in the same compartment as ribosomes. This is probably the selective pressure for the origin of the eukaryotic nucleus. By separating splicing from translation, the slow process of splicing could go to completion in the nucleus so that ribosomes could translate intron-free mRNA in the cytosol. Separation in cells requires membranes, intracellular membranes, and these were provided by the continuously produced outer membrane vesicles of the mitochondrion. This eukaryotic endomembrane system of bacterial lipids is called the endoplasmic reticulum. It is the source of the eukaryotic nuclear membrane both in the cell cycle and in evolution. It divided eukaryotic gene expression into two processes separated in time and space. Intron splicing in the nucleus, followed by translation of mRNA into protein in the cytosol. By excluding active DNA from the cytosol, eukaryotes could express novel kinds of proteins that otherwise would have interfered with gene regulation. And thanks to mitochondrial energy, the young eukaryotic lineage could explore the synthesis of new proteins in massive amounts. The most abundant and prominent of these new proteins formed the cytoskeleton. Shape and movement in eukaryotic cells is governed by cytoskeletal proteins, whose most important and conserved role is in chromosome division. In prokaryotes, chromosomes are partitioned onto daughter cells by attachment to the cell wall during cell division. In eukaryotes, chromosomes are isolated in the nucleus and have to be pushed apart at cell division by microtubules, the workhorses of the cytoskeleton. Nuclear division is essential for survival and growth but cell division can wait, and all major eukaryotic groups harbor lineages with multinucleated cells. The very first eukaryotes likely had a continuously multinucleated, or syncytial, lifestyle. Using relics of the host cell division machinery, a syncytium could generate spores by pinching off random samples of cytoplasm. 
This provided a strong means of selection for spores that contained dividing nuclei for information, dividing mitochondria for energy, and flagella for motility. In order to bring different nuclei into contact with one another, such cells could draw upon a trait possessed by many archaea, cell fusion. This would generate variation needed to surmount the prokaryote to eukaryote transition. With the help of cytoskeleton-dependent nuclear division, a new syncytium could take hold with mitochondrial energy to sustain the growth process. This new domain of life started out as two independent cells, an archaean and a bacterium. It gave rise to the most successful inventors of novel cell shapes and novel cell complexity, the eukaryotes. The very first members of the eukaryotic lineage were likely spore-forming filaments that could live with or without oxygen. From such humble beginnings, all complex life arose, and one fateful endosymbiosis made it possible.